Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Ron Vale, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to Life Science Across the Globe, a Sister Institute seminar series. Last week we heard uh, great talks from South Africa, and now we're going to travel across the Indian Ocean to India. And we'd like to welcome our Sister Institute, the National Center for Biological Science, um, or also nicknamed NCBS. Um, I know NCBS very well. Um, I spent a very happy uh, nine month sabbatical there about a decade ago. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you it's a very warm and welcoming uh, institute. It's set on a, a little oasis of green in the middle of Bangalore. And um, uh, after that great experience, I've been coming back to India every year ever since. Um, the NCBS does amazingly diverse work. It um, spans from atomic structures and molecular mechanisms to tigers and ecosystems. And uh, today for something different from some of our other talks, we're fortunate to hear about some of the latter work and hear about uh, tigers and wildlife in India. So I think this should be very exciting. And uh, now I'd like to welcome the director of the NCBS, um, my friend and colleague, G2 Mayer. Uh, uh, G2 has won many awards. He's won the very uh, prestigious uh, in, in Infosys Prize from India. He's also a foreign um, member of the US National Academy of Science. And he's been director of NCBS since I believe uh, 2013. So, uh, G2, welcome, and uh, we welcome uh, the NCBS to the series. Thanks, Ron. Um, you know, great to see you, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, all across the world. It's great to be part of this series, um, and um, and you know, I just thought I'd tell you a couple of things about NCBS just uh, before I introduce our speakers for the evening. Um, <clears throat> as Ron mentioned, we study you know, everything at all scales in biology from molecules to ecosystems, from, from nanoseconds to evolutionary time. But I must say, um, a large fraction of our work recently uh, has interfaces with, this, with the field, whether it's the wild spaces of our biodiverse neighborhood or, or the clinic uh, where we work with clinicians on human disease uh, relevant to our own uh, ecosystem here. Um, but NCBS did not begin like this. We were very much a laboratory-based research institute focusing on fundamental discovery science. With, you know, but 15 years ago, something changed uh, when one of our foremost tiger conservationists, uh, Ullas Karan, uh, approached us and asked if he would be interested in building a master's program in wildlife and conservation. Uh, uh, which would be geared towards uh, building a new generation of conservationists equipped with the modern tools of biology uh, that, of course, a research uh, environment like ours provided. Uh, we said yes, unknowingly, uh, and I must confess, we've never been the same again. Um, you know, NCBS has also set up uh, two new institutes, the Institute for stem cell science and regenerative medicine, uh, and a not-for-profit uh, company for uh, called CCAMP uh, as a biotechnology startup incubator. Uh, and together with these institutes, uh, we uh, have spearheaded the creation of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, uh, where all the work and research uh, that you're about to hear, hear uh, at least uh, gets written up. Um, you know, without taking any more time, let me introduce my colleagues for today. The two speakers today will give you a glimpse of the kind of field research uh, that this engagement has opened up with our wild spaces. The science talk today will be given by Professor Uma Ramakrishnan. Uh, Uma is a population geneticist interested in understanding patterns of genetic variation in wild species. Uma joined NCBS more than 15 years ago after a PhD at UC San Diego and a postdoc at, the, at Stanford University, uh, just after we had started our wildlife program. <clears throat> she says that this was one of the reasons why 
she decided to come back to India and work at the NCBS. So our wildlife program, you know, did make its first catch. Uh, her group investigated the population biology or investigates the population biology and dynamics of small and large animals. And today she will describe some of her work on a large animal endemic uh, to India, uh, the tiger. She also works on understanding why biodiversity hotspots have so many species. And most recently, uh, you know, uh, is engaged in looking at emerging infectious disease uh, as we know uh, the conditions uh, of our time today. Uh, Uma is a senior fellow with the, with the uh, Department of Biotechnology Wellcome Trust India Alliance. Uh, she uh, is well uh, um, uh, awarded to the uh, Paul Gantry, Gantry Award for, for conservation and Uma uh, will be uh, giving the science talk today. Uh, thanks Jitu and Ron for that introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I usually pace around when I give talks, so it's a little strange to be sitting. Um, but uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you today about some work we've been doing over the last several years uh, on tigers. Um, so I think biodiversity uh, has been on all of our minds for the last two years, even more so. Uh, you know, with the climate strikes, with the declining insects we keep reading about. Uh, and also, uh, more worryingly even, uh, the, the loss of biodiversity and the extinction of species. Uh, even more so, you know, thinking about the pandemic today, we realize that biodiversity is really critical to human well-being. And I'll touch back on that uh, towards the end of the talk. But this slide, for example, shows you uh, a recent assessment by the uh, Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which suggests that several species are threatened with extinction. Uh, for example, a fourth of our mammals on Earth uh, are threatened with extinction. Uh, but as biologists, you know, we want to understand this better. I mean, these are uh, things we see in the media. What is extinction? It is, of course, the loss of all the individuals of a species. But what predisposes a species uh, or a population to extinction? This has been uh, the study of ecologists and uh, conservation biologists for many years now, and we have some insights. For example, we know that a small population size uh, predisposes populations to extinction. So this shows uh, here data from a butterfly uh, where you know, basically with population sizes uh, less than 100, we can think of 100 as some kind of a threshold size. And, like, and I'd like you to remember that number. Uh, there's much higher probabilities of extinction, but as large population sizes overall have low probabilities of extinction. Another factor which uh, affects extinction is how isolated a population is. So here, uh, again, data from butterflies suggests that, you know, when you have many uh, populations living in many patches, um, uh, the time to extinction uh, tends to be much longer. So basically, when you have populations living in few patches, these populations are isolated from each other. And so isolated populations then have higher probabilities of extinction. So what else correlates with extinction or uh, what else may be important? Uh, it turns out that genetic diversity is another uh, important factor in determining a population's uh, chance of extinction. Uh, and this is again what work from butterflies, uh, a lot of this work done by Ilka Hansky's group, uh, which suggests that uh, uh, in these metapopulations of butterflies, uh, those uh, which have low heterozygosity or low genetic variability have a higher probability of, for, of extinction, controlling for effects of isolation and population size. So basically, uh, you know, this is kind of the laundry list that, you know, extinction probability depends on population size, population isolation, and genetic variation. But how does genetics actually affect this process of extinction? Well, uh, basically there's uh, two, two ways. One is when you have very small populations, individuals within a population are related to each other and mating between individuals uh, results in inbreeding. And as we know from uh, several human populations and those of you who work with model systems in the lab, uh, inbreeding leads to inbreeding depression, loss of fitness, which then further uh, pushes populations into what's called an extinction vortex. Um, Similarly, drift uh, is what happens when you have very small population sizes. Uh, basically, 
when populations are very small, there is a stochastic sampling of alleles from one generation to the next, which means that by chance, you may end up fixing a, a rare, but not necessarily advantageous, maybe deleterious even alleles. So um, I'm a population geneticist. And while, for example, Ilka Hansky's group works on extinction with butterflies as a model system, uh, I actually think that um, you know, tigers are a really good model system or, you know, other endangered species to actually study extinction. And I hope to convince you through this talk that this, uh, this is a good, uh, good choice uh, to study extinction. Uh, well, there are several reasons for this. Uh, this is uh, um, a range of uh, a slightly outdated map, but the historical and current range of tigers. And you can see that, you know, already tigers have lost uh, a large proportion of their range. And we've already had local extinctions of tiger populations, the Caspian tiger, the Bali tiger, the Javan tiger, and most recently the South China tiger, which actually existed in a very large um, uh, area. Uh, prior to 1990 when it went extinct there. <clears throat> so uh, tiger populations uh, kind of lost range, but they also became small uh, because of direct human exploitation. So this is a picture of hunting in Raj, in the British Raj times. Uh, and you can see that such, uh, such hunting is sure to have decreased local population size, uh, right? Uh, at the same time, uh, these pressures are ongoing. So there's continued traffic of tiger parts, uh, and these are pictures of uh, vanity purses and so on made from tiger pelt. Uh, and this is another reason why today uh, tigers continue to be uh, to be hunted and exploited, you know, decreasing their population sizes. But what about uh, isolation? Do we actually also see uh, tiger populations becoming more isolated? Well, I'd like to uh, convince you that this is true, just with a thought experiment. Basically, not only have tigers lost habitat, but this habitat has resulted in their living in more and more uh, kind of isolated uh, patches. So this is uh, just a kind of a, a, a predicted map of green cover uh, of India, say in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and today. So you can see that you know, as human population density has increased, uh, the green cover for sure has gone down. And, you know, if we assume that tigers are associated with this, their habitats or where they live has become more and more fragmented, uh, suggesting that populations may have become more isolated. So for these two reasons, the fact that the population sizes have declined and potentially become more isolated, uh, they are predisposed to extinction, but maybe not all populations. And this is uh, the kind of work that I'm interested in doing to understand this a little bit better. But I told you earlier on, and Jitu said that I'm a population geneticist. So I do this with genetic tools. So in some cases, uh, genetic tools are simply, they're simply tools. So, um, you know, tigers are elusive and rare, and sometimes counting the number of tigers or watching how they move is not very easy. But genetic uh, data from individuals can be used uh, as an index to quantify these ecologically relevant parameters of population size and isolation. On the other hand, as we, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, the genetic data themselves are important, uh, genetic variation, to understand processes like inbreeding and drift in uh, potentially isolated populations. So these are the two, two threads uh, of research that we have, uh, we have kind of gone over uh, gone in uh, in our investigations of uh, you know extinction probability of tiger populations. And this is a picture of a tiger, uh, just for some eye candy initially from Ranthambore, which is a park where I've done a lot of work. So we call ourselves molecular scatologists. So you can imagine getting DNA from a tiger is not easy. Um, you know, it's not as easy as collecting a blood sample. Uh, so we use, use mostly non-invasive sources uh, of DNA. Uh, and basically, we walk through forests. Luckily for us, you know, a, a lot of Indian forests have these uh, forests or protected areas have these trails. Um, basically, um, non, they're not uh, um, paved roads. And uh, luckily for us, tigers also use these trails. Uh, and so uh, they deposit feces on these trails. So we identify these feces uh, while we're walking. We uh, pick up. Uh, material, we come back to the lab, extract DNA, and then uh, amplify various kinds of markers. Uh, in the past, microsatellite micro markers, but more recently, uh, SNP markers 
which we can then use to you know, identify individuals, investigate genetic variation, uh, and so on. More recently, we've become interested in understanding uh, you know, properties of individuals trying to reconstruct pedigrees and so on. And in order to do so, we want to actually sample identified individuals. And we've developed, again, some methods where we can do whole genome sequences of tigers from shed hair. So uh, it sounds exciting, but you're basically in the field watching this animal, for example, and when uh, he or she moves away, you go and search the site, you know, not me because my eyesight is really bad, but uh, for young people with really good eyes, they can actually find a lot of this kind of shed hair, which we can then bring back to the lab uh, and do whole genome sequences from. And we've used this, for example, uh, we've shown uh, with, with this work that uh, in this case for whole genome data, uh, shed hair is a much better source of information than is say fecal, a fecal sample. Right? So basically here, and if we try to map that to the tiger genome, uh, while there's a lot of variability in uh, how particular shed hair samples work, you can see that, you know, between 100% and uh, like 5% mapping, uh, overall uh, hair samples work way better than do, for example, uh, fecal samples, because fecal samples have a lot of other DNA, as you can imagine, prey DNA, uh, bacterial DNA and so on. So for this whole genome type of analysis, hair samples, while they may have low amounts of DNA, appear to be better. And we use this method, for example, these methods, for example, to investigate um, matrilines uh, or you know mother relationships for some samples which did which we did not know. Uh, for tigers whom we did not know uh, who their mothers were. And in one case, for example, this individual T47, we found uh, him uh, to be uh, closely, I mean, in the same matriline as a famous tigress called Machli uh, from this particular park. And in another case, we identified unknown an unknown matriline. So these are the things we can do uh, with these types of data. So before we go further, I'll just give you a quick lay of the land. Uh, this is India uh, with uh, its tiger reserves in black. And um, you know, unlike the um, Convention of Biological Diversity, uh, which recommends you know, that 10% of land mass be protected, India has about 5% of its land mass protected. So it's a challenge which Jayashree will talk more with you about. Uh, but um, you know, this is this is uh, where we think most of the tigers in India exist in these black areas. So the first question then is, you know, what are the populations? Are they isolated? What's going on, right? So uh, basically, um, also to remind you, remember those numbers. We have only about five populations which have more than 150 individuals. So right off the bat, you could say that most of these populations should have a high extinction probability if they were not connected to other populations, right? So um, uh, first of all, can we actually count tigers uh, using genetic methods? So this is some work we did a while ago, but basically I mentioned that they're uh, elusive. So counting them by mark recapture uh, with seeing them is, is probably not an option. So we actually just uh, you know used genetic mark recapture where we walk through forests, collect fecal samples, identify individuals, look at how many times we've recaptured those individuals in a statistical framework to estimate uh, tiger population size in a park in southern India. And uh, basically, at the same time, there was a study uh, where camera trap data was being used, uh, where they put up cameras. Since the tigers have unique stripes, you can identify them by their stripes. And our, meth our uh, estimates were very uh, similar to theirs. So basically, this kind of validates genetic tools uh, uh, in even very ecological contexts like population estimation. So I'll, I'll now spend some time telling you about some of our research. Uh, basically, we've, uh, we've uh, been asking questions like, you know, what are the populations in India and are they connected or isolated? We've identified, for example, based on uh, microsatellites, SNPs, and also whole genomes now, that some populations are isolated. And I'll come back to this particular, uh, you know, the purple um, mauve, I don't know, it's whatever, bluish purple population later called Ranthambur. Uh, but uh, it seems like very, through various types of data and samples that uh, this large location in the central part of India, which has many tiger reserves, uh, appears to have uh, very high genetic variation, which is good, uh, and also appears to have uh, connected populations. So in order to understand this connectivity and what drives it or what are the correlates of it better, 
we kind of uh, delved uh, deeper into Central India. And this is uh, some work where we actually went to about 10 tiger reserves, walked through collected uh, tiger samples, came back to the lab, identified individuals, and looked then at you know, genetic sharing, in a sense, between these populations. We then asked what types of landscapes uh, were between these populations, and then inferred uh, you know, connectivity or resistance values uh, for these landscapes, land use types. Okay, so basically, this is just uh, like that same, uh, that same whatever uh, square which we sampled with the different tiger reserves, uh, with you know basically forest, agriculture, and various other kinds of land use types. And you can see there's a lot of uh, fragmentation here. It's not all forest. It's not like the Amazon or something like that, right? Uh, and on the right is basically after we have inferred resistance based on uh, genetic data, we plot it back onto this map. And you can see immediately that the darker areas, which are basically high traffic roads and uh, high density human settlements like cities, seem to be providing high resistance to movement. So these are basically serving as barriers then for tiger movement. Uh, so if that's the case, then as India continues to develop, which is happening very rapidly, uh, what will be the state of tiger connectivity in the future? Today, we see this large swath of protected areas as relatively connected, but will that continue to be true? So in order to understand this better, we modeled um, future landscapes. We tried to model the future. Now, we don't know what the future is going to be. It depends on the decisions we make uh, and how we steer development. But we modeled 56 versions or scenarios for the future and asked, given a particular scenario, what happens to tiger connectivity, uh, genetic variation, and extinction? Okay. Uh, and remember, uh, back to the earlier slides, we would expect then the tiger populations, which are large uh, and connected, would have low extinction probabilities. And those which are small and isolated should have high extinction probabilities. So we again now hundred years into the future, explore extinction probabilities for these specific tiger reserves in Central India, right? So it's not a broad generalization, but a specific inquiry about this area. And this again, uh, gra this graph shows you some of our results. So basically you have a uh, population size of a particular park on the x-axis and isolation index on the y. Uh, the higher the isolation index, the more isolated that population is. Uh, and the color of the dot is basically extinction probability. So as we expected, uh, small and isolated populations had high extinction probabilities and large and connected. But see, even this is not very large. You know, the largest population is about close to 180 or 100 individuals uh, have low extinction probabilities. But what's interesting is there's a lot of populations in between right? And so, for example, uh, for these populations on the far um, left, right, they are really small in population size, but some of them are pretty high in terms of their connectivity. So, in that, in those populations, increasing population size might be a good intervention to kind of push them, you know, more in this direction and further minimize extinction probability. So then one could go back and ask what kind of land use change scenario, what development in the future, what version of the future would enable that? So that's, that was our idea with constructing these models is to quantitatively evaluate the uh, impacts of development, for example, on, on extinction, right? And it actually worked to some extent. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, you know, um, um, what was a relatively narrow highway uh, NH7, the National Highway 7, which was bifurcating two protected areas, Kanha and Pinch. Pinch is famous, that's where, um, you know, whatever, Mowgli, Jungle Book was written, right? But uh, basically, there was a proposal to widen this highway uh, to a six-lane highway. And in our simulations, we were able to show that doing so and making this a barrier would uh, basically increase extinction probability significantly for the whole landscape. And this was used uh, in amongst other studies uh, in, a, in court to uh, petition for uh, underpass, which was then basically wildlife friendly and allowed continued movement uh, of individuals potentially uh, in, through across these two protected areas. 
So, uh, so coming back now to more genetics versus uh, tools, genetic tools to understand ecology. Um, I, I said earlier that I'm interested, uh, and many people are in inbreeding depression and inbreeding. And so we focused, we focused more recently on this uh, potentially isolated population called Ranthambore Tiger Reserve. It seems really close, but it is actually completely cut off. Uh, there seems to be no gene flow in or out of this park. Uh, so then do we see signatures of isolation? Do we see that individuals here are inbred? Uh, and do we see higher deleterious allele load and so on? These are some of the questions we ask. I won't show you all the, the statistics uh, and the results in detail, but uh, basically, uh, I'd like, I mean, I hope you'll believe me, but we sequenced several whole genomes from across India. We quantified inbreeding using uh, these runs of homozygosity. So basically, uh, for example, if you look at several inbred human populations, they have these long stretches in the genome which are completely homozygous. Uh, and basically, we found that inbreeding as quantified by these genomic runs of homozygosity suggests that Ranthambhor tigers are twice as inbred as uh, other tigers from other parts of India. Uh, also, interestingly, we were able to predict deleterious alleles or uh, those which we think may have detrimental effects on fitness. These are predictions. Uh, we should bear that in mind. Uh, and we find that such alleles, though there are fewer of them in Ranthambore, they seem closer to fixation. Uh, their frequencies are higher than in other tiger populations. While we don't see any direct fitness effects yet, we don't see any abnormalities yet in these tigers, the litter size in Ranthambo does seem to be lower. So we are hoping to continue work here to really track this population as I hope it's not heading to extinction, but at least uh, track this whole process. Um, also, another very interesting story, which is completely something we started investigating by chance, is from another potentially isolated population though it's in this larger Central Indian cluster called Simlipal Tiger Reserve. This is home uh, to these uh, really uh, beautiful pseudo-melanistic tigers. They seem to be not found anywhere else uh, in any other part of tiger range. Uh, and this is a camera trap image of a normal and a melanistic, pseudo-melanistic tiger. Pseudo-melanistic because they're not completely black, right? Uh, so here we were actually very lucky. We were able to identify the genetic basis for this phenotype. It turned out to be a, a single point missense mutation. We were able to do this from a zoo pedigree of tigers, which included melanistic cubs. Uh, we were able to then go back to the wild and, and you know, non-invasively, I mean, this is no joke. Uh, my student here, Vinay, who's done this work, worked in Simlipal for three months and he never saw a single tiger but he was able to actually uh, estimate the frequency of this allele in the wild from fecal samples. And uh, we are basically suggesting here that drift or stochastic sampling of alleles may have resulted in a very high frequency of this mutation that we see in this population alone, uh, and which is seemingly absent elsewhere. So I just want to quickly wrap up uh, in the next couple of minutes, which with something which may seem like an aside, but we talked a lot about, you know, how, uh, habitats for tigers are being fragmented and so on. And a lot of this is because of land use change, not just loss of habitat, but the conversion of say grasslands or forests into human habitation or agriculture and so on. And the constantly increasing interface between humans and wildlife, right? And we, we know this uh, really well today uh, because of the situation we are in, the pandemic is basically a zoonotic spillover event. Uh, and several studies recently have tried to, uh, you know, look at the origins of the zoonotic uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and very nice work, you know, whether it's closer to pangolins or bats and so on are ongoing. Um, but we know kind of broadly from meta-analyses that spillover uh, usually seems to be high when there's high mammal biodiversity, high human population density and high land use change. And India is really top marks for all of these, right? So, uh, so something which I've been very curious about is what about spillover in India? Is there spillover in India or not? And can we actually study this process just like we're studying the process of extinction? So we've been doing some work in the Northeast on bats. Uh, on the right, you see um, a species richness map of bats. And you can see basically Northeastern India is pretty red, which means there are high numbers of bat species here. Uh, and we've been working on um, with a community uh, in the northeast of India studying, um, you know, bats and RNA viruses they harbor. We may have identified something interesting, but maybe I'll talk about that another time. 
So I've been really lucky to work with a fantastic team of people. Um, these are some of the students, Prachi, Meghna, Anubhav, whose work I discussed today. Uh, very inspiring. This is hard work. It sounds like National Geographic, but it is really a lot of grant work. Uh, and we've been lucky to be assisted in the field by fantastic people like Mujahid. You know, he's been working on Digers for 10 years now. Uh, and we've also worked with him on a book. Uh, check it out if you have time. It's a reader level one book. Uh, and of course, uh, all of this work is incredibly expensive. And I've been supported uh, by a lot of uh, organizations and, of course, uh, uh, huge support from NCBS. I leave you with this uh, beautiful picture from Ran Tambor uh, and the hope that in the future uh, we will continue to have these wild spaces uh, for uh, our children and their children to enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Uma. That was a fantastic talk. Really interesting. Uh, I think we will uh, jump right into some questions. Um, so we have a couple of questions from Ruchi Mangluña. Um, Ruchi, are you there? Would you like to ask your, uh, would you like to ask your questions? Uh, let's see. Um, okay. I do not hear Ruchi, but I'm going to go ahead and ask her questions on her behalf. Um, so she, her first question is, um, how do you manage to get the DNA from the feces? Is it because there are um, cells shed from the intestines? Yes, correct. So basically, uh, you know, when we, even when we uh, collect samples for uh, uh, genetic analysis, what we've started doing recently is we just uh, take a swab and we just roll it over the top part of the feces because the epithelial cells uh, are all are there, basically. Um, so it's basically shed cells, which have tiger DNA. Yeah. And um, Rishi's second question is, um, is it possible to introduce diversity within an isolated population by adding individuals from another population? That's an excellent question, Ruchi, and that's uh, something which is very hotly debated in conservation today. Uh, it's called assisted gene flow. Um, the idea of bringing individuals in, and it's been considered, you know, even for uh, species like, say, Tasmanian devils, where they have a high frequency of this mutation, which causes this mouth cancer, which is, you know, uh, causing a lot of problems for them. Uh, so whether it is introducing uh, individuals with beneficial alleles or just introducing individuals to uh, increase variation uh, is something which uh, uh, scientists are debating and thinking about, like, how should we introduce individuals? Um, what should be the strategy to select individuals to increase variation? In the context of Rantambor, it's something we have uh, thought about. Uh, but basically, um, for now, we don't yet see inbreeding depression, right? Uh, so until that point, uh, you know, individuals are inbred, uh, and we can consider introducing them, in, uh, individuals from elsewhere. But um, yeah, let's see what, how things uh, turn out in the future. So, so a, a somewhat related question um, in terms of genetic drift and inbreeding depression, um, are there specific um, genetic mutations that you've seen um, that are strong predictors of population decline? And is there a plan to look at um, the physiologic effects of these? Yeah, so that would be uh, something which I, I would love to do. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be that simple. So drift is stochastic. Uh, and so it's basically any, any allele, good, bad, ugly, can increase in frequency, right? Uh, and so, for example, though, in, in this particular population in Simlipal, maybe it's this particular allele which uh, gives this melanistic phenotype, which we can see. It could have been any other allele which we may not have been able to detect, right? Uh, so um, having specific markers for uh, such processes might be difficult. But for example, if uh, there are some known deleterious alleles uh, in cats, for example, we could look for whether they have uh, high frequencies in tigers or if there are known um, you know, specific things we know correlate with fitness. Those would probably the, be the best ones to go after. As of now, we don't have enough of those. We don't have a bouquet of those yet, yeah. right? Because tigers are not a model organism. We don't know enough about their uh, genetics, really, per se. Right. But yeah, that would be very interesting to do if we could. Um, there's also a related question um, from one of our attendees named Aditi. Aditi, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? No. 
I think I will ask the question. Um, so um, Aditi wants to know, how do you attribute the high frequency of the, the melanism mutation to drift and, and not nat natural selection? How do we know that it's not something that's adaptive? Yeah, so um, I think that that's something which we can, uh, we will only know uh, for sure when we do long-term studies on the population to look at whether the fitness effects of individuals which carry the melanistic alleles, uh, you know, they have higher fitness or not, right? Uh, so that that my, I can't do. Uh, 50 years from now is when that study would have to be done. I mean, from now to 50 years from now. Uh, but um, all we can do is we can model, uh, we can model whether drift is sufficient to explain this uh, change in allele frequency. Selection, invoking selection uh, might be, uh, is not parsimonious. Uh, and as far as we know, there are uh, not in the same mutation, but there are uh, mutations in this gene which result in similar phenotypes in cats and cheetahs, and they don't seem to have any effect on fitness, either positive or negative. So basically, that's our best guess right now. It would have to be investigated further. Sure. And so I think we need to move on to Jashri, but before we do, I want to ask you just um, one more question that has come up several times in the box is, can you tell us in a nutshell, Uma, how you got into this particular field? <laughs> Uh, I just, uh, I just feel like it's like being like a detective. Um, and I just, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I'm really curious uh, about uh, trying to decipher what's happening in nature. Uh, and I probably never get the answers right. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's just, I'm just curious to know what what's happening. Awesome. Thank you. And actually, in our, 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 we're going to move on to our next speaker. And in um, Jayashri's talk, she is going to tell us a little bit more about um, one potential way to get into the field of, of wildlife biology and conservation.